living in New York City. I bought it, I know, because I bought it in October of uh, right after 9-11. Wow. So I was on 23rd Street, I lived on 18th Street at the time, and I walked into Chelsea Guitars, and it was pretty beat up already. He's like, Jack, you keep coming in and playing that guitar. It's obviously the right guitar for you. I was like, yeah, I don't have any money. He goes, yeah, you never have any money. He goes, I'll tell you what. You give me $1,100 cash. I haven't sold anything since 9-11. And we didn't call it 9-11 yet, right? <laughs> it was just, we haven't had anything since the buildings collapsed. And, I, and he's like, I, have, I need some cash. He goes, and that's way under just like, if you have 1100 get it now and before I changed my mind. So I ran to the city bank down the road and my bank account had $1,200 in it. And I bought this guitar for $1,100. And I came back to tell my roommate that I didn't have the rent. But look at this guitar. And he just sort of just. Um, so then, I, I, uh, around that time, I was sort of like having a good run in the press in New York. and. And uh, so I got a call to go open up for Merle Haggard. Um, so that says, yeah, Merle Haggard, he signed, you would sign the year. Unfortunately, I wore a lot of Merle Haggard off. I put some nail polish to try to keep his name there, but you can see Hag there. So now um, I'm playing the, the Mountain Winery in, uh, in California, and uh, I open the set. And as soon as I start playing, I kid you not, as soon as I start playing, the sewage system was right at the level of where the crowd is, so it was below me, I'm on the stage. And as, as soon as I started, a huge waft of sewage smell hit the crowd. Oh. Like all, like nine, like 12 porta potties just opened and they, they hit the crowd. So I start my first song and I literally see the whole crowd go. Maybe I'm from New York, I'm not authentic, okay, I didn't know one. So, eventually they kind of relaxed, but it was a weird way to start the set. And the thing about Merle is that, what's so beautiful is Merle doesn't let anybody, like generally he only let people open for him solo. Because he doesn't, he, it, the thing that was amazing about Merle, if you ever saw Merle Hunted Live, his stage volume with his band is literally a whisper. And I watched him during uh, rehearsal. He doesn't even, he uses his guitar without the band while they have to all lean in and he, he just get trains them to hear things super quiet. So he doesn't want a loud band opening for him. So I open solo, I finish, I'm walking up the stone steps of this majestic winery. Merle Haggard's coming down looking at me and he just looks at me and goes, how do you do? I was like, well, it started a little shitty, but I, I warmed him up. And I think they're ready for me. And he's like, all right. And then I'll, he's staring at my guitar and I go, hey Merle, I was wondering if you would sign this guitar. And he's like, what? You don't want an old man like me signing a guitar like this. And I was like, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> so he takes the guitar, he starts signing it. And at that time he had come out with a, a, an album called, uh, where he did um, a Blaze Foley song, If I Can Only Fly. And uh, that was the title. And I said, hey, I was wondering if you'd sing If I Can Only Fly tonight. And his band, Red Volker, and a bunch of guys at the time, like, they all lit up, because they, you know, they're expecting someone to say one of the big hits. And he, there, he was, a, and all of a sudden, Merle signed the guitar, he's like, oh, if I can only fly? Yeah. And he kind of smiled. So he goes to hand the guitar back to me, and he pulls it away, and he, he goes, he goes, hang on a sec. I think I'll feel a few more, few more songs in this guitar. Smiles at me. So I hadn't smoked uh, cigarettes in like seven years. And that experience was so just, I didn't know what to do with myself. I went and bought a pack of Marlboro Reds. <laughs> and I chain smoked <laughs> at the side of the stage. I was so amazing. I just smoked them. I don't know, I had to. I couldn't, I couldn't calm down. And so about the second song, Merle looks at me and winks and goes into the song. And so, yeah, so that's that sign, signing. Um, and then, uh, uh, Doc Watson, uh, I had the honor of opening up for him at the bottom line. Oh, wow. And uh, that's again, um, I have a have, I don't, I'm not a big, I'm more, I'm not, I don't smoke pot very often. This is the second time I've brought up smoking pot, I believe, maybe the third. Uh, I don't know why that's happening tonight. <laughs> I'm not really a pot smoker to tell you the truth. But I opened for Doc Watson and I met him, we had this great time and, and then uh, 
a couple of people were, it's in New York, so all my homeboys are there all celebrating, and somebody passes a joint, come on, you smoke, you open for, for, for Doc Watson. I was like, so I take a little hit of the thing, and I'm a lightweight with that stuff. I immediately was like, so as soon as I'm scared to even like walk out of the room, the, uh, Alan Pepper, the owner of the bottom line, goes, Jack, Doc wants to talk to you. <laughs> so I go into, the, into Doc Watson's room, and he, he sits down, and Jack Lawrence was playing guitar with him at the time, goes, hey, uh, I'm going to go get paid. You two just hang out. So then I sat there with Doc Watson for like 40 minutes. Oh and we hung out, and I asked him about songs he wrote. And at one point, because of course I was a little paranoid and terrified, I, uh, I remember at one point I said, so do you remember when you wrote the riff to Windy and Warm? It's one song. So anyway, he, he's, he's, so I ask him the question, he goes like this. <laughs> of course, to me at this point, it's seven hours. <laughs> and I'm thinking he's stewing about what a jerk I am. <laughs> So he, it continues on for another seven hours. He keeps a blank face and goes, You know, I can't say I recall how that movie was presented. <laughs> and then this moment is when I realized the difference between a North Carolina gentleman and a kid from New York. Because anyone from New York, even if it was a New York folk songwriter, they go, um, that's a good question. Let me think about that. You know, I can't really think of what happened. We, we know how to fill the gap to make you feel comfortable. Whereas he just came from that different generation where he was perfectly comfortable to sit there quiet till he had an answer. So it was terrifying and, and uh, informative at the same time. I don't know if there'll be any more marijuana stories. I'm not sure. I can't promise you. <laughs> so... Uh, just while we go through the guitar, and then the next one was Charlie Leuven of the Leuven Brothers. Wow. Um, that was an interesting experience because Charlie Leuven was basically in retirement. Right. And at the time, I booked a place in New York City called the Rodeo Bar. I booked the music there for 13 years. It was New York's longest running honky tonk. And after a while, I started to get into this mode like, hey, people want to play here. They're, and I got a little budget. Like, let's have some fun. I called someone like, what, where's Charlie Leuven? He's just home. You want his phone number? Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I just pick up and I get, I get Charlie's phone number. He's like, hello? Like, I, uh, is, is Charlie around? This is Charlie. <laughs> so I get on the phone with Charlie and I begin to have like a week, a few weeks of conversations with Charlie to convince him that what I'll do is get, fly him to New York and I'll put together a band. He'll pick his songs and I'll have a band. I have learned all his songs and I'll give him $900 a night after expenses just for him to come show up. He's like, no one wants to hear me. I'm like, trust me, I <laughs> want to hear you. So Charlie shows up and sure enough, there's a line of people and there's a lot, at the time it was the, the burgeoning kind of Brooklyn country scene. So a line of 20 something women were lined up and I'll tell you something that you learned quickly about Charlie Wooden. He was a dirty old man. <laughs> He couldn't stop, like, you come here, honey. I, mean, I was like, all right, Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> but, I mean, he was so moved. He's like, this is the best band I, I can recall having. I can't, so we got him. And we had this wonderful time, and he came back the second year. Long story short, I pulled him out of retirement, and two years later, before he died, he won a Grammy. Wow. Woo. wow. You know, hey, you, I pulled him out of retirement. I'm the one that called. <laughs> and then, let's see. Um, and then the, the last one is Randy Newman. Ooh, um, I, I used to do uh, this, this show, The Takeaway. I was the cultural commentator on the show. And uh, so they were kind of doing some changeover. And the, the, you know, the, what happened was Randy Newman was, I, I, went to, I walked in and my, my green room always had a piano in it. And I, got, I go to get in my green room to do this like last little show because they were changing up the lineup. And I go to the woman who helped me, she gets me my coffee, I go, where's the piano? She goes, I don't know. And all of a sudden, you know, the radio WNYC is playing, and I hear a piano. I was like, wait, there's someone playing the piano over the air. And all of a sudden, you hear it, and I just, it's Randy Newman. I go, Randy Newman has the piano. <laughs> and so I know, I was like, I know exactly what's about to happen. He's going to finish right before I go on. I quickly searched for a pen, and as soon as he came out, I said, Randy, sign this. He smiled inside the thing, and there's the end of that story. And there's all the signs in there. <laughs> That's the guitar stories.
Um, 